Welcome to a world where nothing is quite as it seems. Welcome to Fake Britain. Get on! Get on! On the floor now! Don't put your hand behind your back now! Here at the Fake Britain House, we'll reveal the fakes that are flooding the market, conning people like you and me and making money for the criminals. We'll investigate the fraudsters who are selling us something that isn't real and could be dangerous. And we'll help you avoid falling for a fake. Today on Fake Britain, a faker selling houses that didn't exist, that left some people homeless and penniless. Your mind, you don't want to believe that such a terrible thing is actually happening. And at the court, the man behind the con attacks one of his victims. Hey, you just netbotted me! Fake children's cycle helmets, potentially putting thousands of lives at risk. I wouldn't want that to happen to my children. Fake printer helplines targeting the most vulnerable members of society. I queried the level of £690, and I was told that my father had elected for lifetime insurance cover. Well, my father's 91, you know, he wasn't going to go for lifetime cover. And an enforcement operation reveals fake tobacco packaged as dried mushrooms. It's a very professional setup. They've shipped it in with the deliberate intent to mislead the ports, and it's very organised and professional gangs by the looks of it. For most of us, buying a house is the single biggest investment we'll ever make in our lifetimes. And here in Britain, around two-thirds of us are lucky enough to own our own home. Over the last 10 years, Britain has seen a sharp rise in buying properties off plan, which means agreeing to buy a house that hasn't yet been built. And they're in high demand. These properties are often part of new developments, with entrepreneurs buying land and getting plans drawn up before producing glossy brochures to lure buyers. But what if the developer was faking it and he didn't own the land, had no intention of building any houses, and it was all part of an elaborate fake to rob you of your life savings? Steve and Lillian Ritchie have always owned their own home. Lillian suffers with mobility issues and is now registered disabled. Money is tight, so to help make ends meet, they wanted a property that was cheaper to run. We lived in Leicestershire. We had a nice bungalow, all adaptions for her disabilities. Um, but still, it was uh, a bit much to keep, so we was looking to, to downsize, maybe do something a little bit different, easier and have a better quality of life. They'd always dreamt of living near the sea and owning a small holding where they could live a simple life, growing their own fruit and vegetables and rearing animals. And they thought they'd found just what they were looking for when they heard about a company selling off-plan timber homes in Devon called Dream Coastal and Country Homes, not to be confused with any other company with a similar name. Spoke with the marketing manager and she basically totally sold it to us. It was ideal, so it, it went from there. We made an appointment to go and see some land, um, and it, it was absolutely brilliant. Barry Lee was the man behind the company. And he just came over as a, a, a really nice chap uh, that would go out of his way to, to, to create for you exactly uh, what you wanted, you know? So there was no, nothing that made me think untoward or anything. He is a very confident, professional guy. Steve and Lillian viewed a plot of land. Barry told them he owned it and had planning permission to build on it. Barry also said these plots were in high demand and they're selling fast. We met him there and he told us that the, uh, there's lots of interest in this um, development. Um, so on viewing the land, if you to show you that you was genuine, then a £1,900 deposit, plot reservation, would be needed to be made to secure that plot. Having paid a holding deposit, Stephen Lillian agreed to pay a further £140,000 for one of Barry Lee's off-plan timber homes. Barry's company even helped sell their bungalow, which would give them just enough money to buy their dream timber home. 
Contracts were drawn up and the money from the sale of their bungalow was held by Barry whilst the details of their timber house were finalised. So you just chose the spec, how big you wanted it, how many rooms you wanted. <laughs> Where you wanted your plug holes. Uh, every mortal thing. Steve and Lillian couldn't wait to see their new house finally built. So much so, they decided to live on the plot whilst the construction took place. We was living on the piece of land for maybe a week or so, uh, you know, really enjoying it. Every day we was bursting to get up and start doing things, you know. But their excitement was short-lived. The house was never built, and they received a visit from someone who claimed to own the land, rather than Barry Lee. That's when we realised something is totally wrong with this deal um, and started doing our own sort of investigations and ringing round the, the park home industry people, the landowners, to try and find out what is really going on. Steve and Lillian weren't the only ones looking into Barry Lee. Over 100 miles away in Hampshire, Trading Standards Officer Ben Meredith had got wind of Barry Lee's dodgy dealings after receiving complaints from a number of disgruntled customers. Dream Coastal and Country Homes were essentially trying to sell victims or consumers their dream, uh, painting this picture of a lovely existence on the southwest coast of England. We'd had a couple of consumer complaints come to us indicating that something was up with Dream Coastal and Country Homes. Uh, so we then decided to look into it further and see what the situation was because there were large sums of money being uh, talked about, so we need to look into that. Ben came across marketing material which Dream Coastal and Country Homes was giving to their prospective customers. And on the surface, it looked like a legitimate property development company. Here's an example of uh, the advertising material that would be in Park Home Builders offices. The advertising material was really professional, well produced, uh, looked exactly the part. It contained all the information you'd expect to see about the development and the off-plan properties. All of these documents were part of the impression he was creating to indicate that the business owned the land they were selling and that they were doing well and were reputable to deal with. But there was one major problem. Barry Lee was a complete fraud. He didn't own the land he was selling and he had no intention of building any timber homes. He was a fake property developer and he'd just robbed Steve and Lillian of their life savings, leaving them with no money, no home and no hope of ever getting it back. I couldn't sleep. Uh, I, f I felt agitated, I was very depressed. I, no matter what anybody said about it, it's all going to work out, I, I knew within my heart that there was something radically wrong here. Uh, in your, your mind, you don't want to believe that such a terrible thing is actually happening. And Steve and Lillian weren't the only ones. Ben discovered Barry Lee had taken out advertisements in magazines sold all over Britain. This is an example of the advertising material that Dream Coast and Country Homes are using in uh, Country Home Press, Country Home Magazines. Once Barry Lee had lured his customers in and struck a deal, he wanted to get his hands on hundreds of thousands of pounds of their money. So he issued them paperwork like this. Here is an example of the agreement which clearly shows on here that Dream Coast and Country Homes are the owner, when in fact they're not. Uh, victims were taken in by these documents, other businesses were taken in by these documents. Everyone had thought Dream Coast and Country Homes was a legitimate business. Later, we learn there were simply no limits to this fakery. Here's an example of where Mr Lee uh, forged a online banking document to make it look like he had nearly a million pounds in their bank. And we witness a shocking act of violence when Steve confronts the man behind the fake development. In Lewisham, South London, the authorities are battling the latest trend in the fight against fake cigarettes. Here, criminal gangs are illegally importing shredded tobacco in bulk into Britain, then producing packets of fake rolling tobacco in backstreet factories all over South London. Crime enforcement and regulations manager Nick Stabler is leading the fight against the fakers. This is how we'd normally find the products imported. First of all, you'll see that it's, it's in a Pampers box. Uh, this is going to this is designed to put uh, put customs off. Inside, we've got a bag of tea, but actually, instead of having tea inside, it's got the shredded tobacco bales. 
Once gangs have smuggled it into Britain using fake packaging, it's then turned into fake rolling tobacco by rehydrating it with white vinegar and adding vanilla essence. They will mix it all together to make it feel and smell like the, uh, like the real, real product as opposed to the fake product. They will then take a wadge of this and place it in one of their pre-made fake packaging. This fake rolling tobacco claims to be the well-known brand Amber Leaf. And there's one more thing to fool buyers it's the real deal before it's sold in high street shops. They'll seal it and then for the final touch they'll add a duty, a duty paid stamp so that people will, uh, will believe that it is a genuine product rather than being fake and they're more likely to buy it and smoke it. For the seven million smokers in Britain, this spells bad news. The people that are making this fake product are producing a product which is potentially, uh, potentially unsafe for the individual smoking it. You just don't know what you're going to be finding in it. OK, everyone, thanks for coming this morning. Because the team have found so much of this fake tobacco across South London, they've launched a big operation to clamp down on the gangs behind this racket. The fake Britain cameras have been allowed in to see what's really going on. It's quite a large problem at the moment. We are working pan, pan London, across London, with, um, uh, with other, other boroughs to tackle it. The 10-strong team will be raiding a number of different premises linked to the production and sale of this fake rolling tobacco. Thank you very much. Any questions? The team suspect the illegal tobacco is coming in from overseas through a series of high street mailbox shops scattered across South London. Crime enforcement and regulation manager Julian Wyard is on his way to carry out a raid. They have intelligence the address is being used to traffic the fakes. This is where the fake goods are import. They come through the airports and into these uh, these sorts of businesses where they're collected by individuals and then taken to the uh, factories where they're actually packaged up in the um, counterfeit fake packaging. There's no guarantees they'll find any, but Julian is feeling quite optimistic. I'm hoping to find um, raw tobacco, and if we're lucky, we, we, we could get uh, quite a large amount. Julian is joined by dog handler Stuart Phillips, who's looking after the team's secret weapon, Yo-Yo, the sniffer dog. He's trained to find any type of tobacco product, genuine tobacco, counterfeit tobacco, shisha. Um, and we'd obviously we'd go into the shops and after trading the standards have, um, have done their uh, introduction bit, um, then Yo-Yo will, uh, will do his bit then. OK. Once inside the High Street mailbox shop, Yo-Yo wastes no time having a sniff around in the basement. Dogs, their sense of smell is like a thousand times better than uh, humans, and um, they, they smell like in colour, and they can uh, smell through all the other scents, they'll be able to smell tobacco. And it doesn't take long before he finds something of interest. He's really having a good sniff there, and then he's, 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 he's stopping. The basement is stacked with boxes. But dog handler Stuart is convinced Yo-Yo's onto something as he finds a stash of packages shipped in from China. But beneath three layers of wrappers are what appear to be a pack of dried Chinese mushrooms. Or are they? I can smell tobacco. But all might not be as it seems, so Julian comes down for a second opinion. It's very well wrapped. That's going to be tobacco. It's tobacco. The team are in luck. Yo-Yo's nose was spot on, as what's packaged as dried mushrooms is the illegal tobacco they're after. Unmistakably. A bale of hand rolling tobacco. The Lewisham team have previously found tobacco imported using fake tea bag packaging, but this is the first time they've seen it packaged as fake dried mushrooms. The dried mushroom aspect is, is, is new to us, but the fact that it's being shipped in pertaining to be a different product is very commonplace. 
From this point of view, it's a very professional setup. They've shipped it in um, it, with, the, with the deliberate intent to mislead the port, and it's very organised and professional gangs by the looks of it. But the gang's fakery was no match for Yo-Yo's nose. Two, three, four, five, six layers of packaging. Yep. And this dog smelt that. And he smelt it from like a metre away yeah, under all of this. Good lad. Good lad. One, two, three. Nick estimates they've seized around £2,000 worth of tobacco and he thinks it may be a vital clue in bringing the people behind this illegal importation racket to justice. It's been concealed in, in, inside a sealed mushroom bag, so I'll be looking into the, uh, the company that produces these mushrooms and looking at what other products they import um, and how, uh, how that might link in with the importation of uh, fake tobacco. And there's more good news. Upstairs, the team's found information about the sender of these packages, which Julian thinks will give them a head start in tracking down the people behind it. We recognise the name and we suspect it's uh, part of a, uh, a criminal net network that we have been investigating for a number of months. With the fake tobacco bagged and tagged, there's no time to celebrate as the team have a busy day ahead. Next on the team's hit list is a high street Chinese supermarket. They believe this premises may be used in the production of the fake rolling tobacco. And down in the storeroom, almost immediately, this time, it's Scampi's nose that starts twitching. Have a whiff. What is it? It's tobacco. Strangely, it smells like tobacco, but it's unlike any other tobacco the team have come across. Well... Oh. It's difficult to describe it really because you wouldn't. It's raw tobacco. Um, it's been it comes, com yeah. completely unprocessed oh. as yet. It's, it absolutely stinks. Yeah, really Julian suspects this is the latest oh, attempt boy. at disguising this illegal tobacco to get it through customs. Okay. Oh, yeah. oh no, it smells like tobacco. It's, yeah, it's tobacco. Oh god, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It tends to come in. Uh, by air from China, and then it's sort of sent on to the uh, factory where it's processed. That so would normally be in a, in, a, in a residential house or a house of multiple occupation. Once processed, it can be used to make fake rolling tobacco. It'll be shredded, and then it will be um, put into counterfeit packaging, fake, fake packaging for uh, hand rolling tobacco. Nick thinks it's another piece of the jigsaw. It's quite a good find because this is this is obviously where it's been imported into the into the UK uh, for further distribution. But this operation is not over yet. Nick is on his way to a news agent. He has intelligence in maybe selling the type of fake rolling tobacco produced by the gangs running this racket. But as soon as he enters the premises... Hello there. Someone's keen to make a swift getaway. Hello, my friends. Hello. You all right? Where are you off to? Yeah, yeah. I need to get the something from here. If Nick wasn't already suspicious, he certainly is now. OK. I'm guessing he didn't want to be here. He ran away, um, so I, I'm not quite sure why he was running away, cos I hadn't spoken to him. Um, but we'll maybe go and find out what's, what's going on now. I would like to find out a little bit about when we came in. Yeah. Obviously, there was a, uh, a, a gentleman here yeah. who ran away, ran away. Do you know why he might have run away? Um, I don't know. So. It concerns me about what practices I might find are amiss here. OK. With the woman behind the counter keeping type lipped, Nick decides to search the premises. And out back, he finds a shopping trolley. And inside it, a black bag. Four pouches of amber leaf tobacco. But Nick doesn't think it's just any ordinary rolling tobacco. My concerns are that this is actually a counterfeit product. It certainly doesn't feel like it's 50 grams, like it states on the top. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the quality of the packaging is, 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 is very inferior. 
If fake, Nick suspects it could be the type of product produced from the raw tobacco they seized earlier. And on closer inspection, there are more telltale signs to suggest it could be fake. It doesn't have English writing, and you can see that the warning is offset. This suspected fake pouch of amber leaf with the off-centre warning looks remarkably like the fake packaging used by the gangs running these South London fake tobacco rackets. Normally you'd have that square in the middle. The packaging generally is, is, is inferior, so I'm going to take it today for further investigation. Nick's seen enough. The tobacco is seized along with a shopping trolley it was stashed in. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Back at base and a suspected fake tobacco from today's operation checked into the storeroom. I can't even lift that. Nick and the team now have a mound of work ahead of them, investigating the people responsible for the product seized today and hopefully bringing them to justice. So today we've had a successful operation. Not only have we found some... Uh, fake tobacco products. We have also identified new ways that they are importing the fake products into the UK using mushroom packaging and we found uh, the raw tobacco product as opposed to the shredded tobacco product being brought in alongside dried mushrooms which would come in this packaging. Therefore it is another way of trying to evade both duty and dupe people into buying a, uh, what they believe to be a real product when actually it's fake. Things are more annoying than a printer that won't work. It's so frustrating. But perhaps some support is not far away. There's a handy helpline I can subscribe to so I can speak to someone who will solve the problem for me. Sounds good. Unless, as we've discovered, it's a helpline that's fake and fleecing thousands of people out of huge sums of cash. <laughs> When our parents or loved ones start getting older, the simple things in life can become a struggle. It's natural for us to become concerned, as Sarah Dox is, about her 91-year-old father, Anthony. I ring my father pretty well every evening now. We have a chat about what's gone on during the day. But on one recent phone call, Sarah was worried. Over the weekend, he had realised that he had a print job that was repeating itself. I think it was 52 pages long, just kept on and on and on printing. Anthony tried everything he could to get the printer to stop, but to no avail. So he decided to call Epson, the manufacturer of the printer, and found a number online for what he thought was the Epson helpline. He rang one of the numbers and he was told he was speaking to an Epson technician. The man kept Anthony on the phone for over five and a half hours and even asked him for the password to his tablet so he could access his device remotely. At the end of this five and a half hours, he said, I'm sorry, we can't help you with your printer. What we will do is we will send you a new, quote, free printer and it will arrive next week, but what you must do is to put a cheque for £690 into the post today. As soon as Sarah found out her father had sent a cheque for £690, alarm bells rang. The following morning, she contacted the helpline company herself to check them out. They were adamant that they were the genuine customer support line for Epson printers. And I queried the level of £690, and I was told that my father had elected for lifetime insurance cover for this new printer that was being sent through the post. Well, my father's 91, you know, he, he wasn't going to go for lifetime cover. At this point, Sarah suspected that her father, Anthony, had been the latest victim of a fake helpline. And he wasn't the only one. At the offices of the genuine Epson printers, Managing Director Rob Clark has been inundated with customers complaining about being charged extortionate amounts of money for what appeared to be an Epson printer helpline. That's a really shocking thing for me because we don't charge uh, on a customer service basis, we don't charge for uh, fixing people's uh, problems. It became clear to Rob that his company's genuine printer helpline service had been faked. These were complaints that people were making where they hadn't actually been in contact with the Epson customer services. They'd been in contact with uh, a third party. 
Sarah contacted Trading Standards to report the company. Her complaint landed on the desk of Mike Andrew of the E! Crime Team. And sadly, this isn't the first time he's come across these fake telephone helplines, which most consumers find through website searches. So this is an example of the page that a consumer would see, and quite clearly you can see why a consumer could be deceived into thinking that they were actually on the genuine Epson technical support. And on face value, there's nothing to make you suspect it's anything other than the genuine Epson support. Big bold letters, Epson technical support, the use of Epson and, and, a, and a printer logo up here, um, the use of um, a free phone UK number, all of this gives the impression that they're dealing with a genuine Epson technical support line. Anthony was conned into buying a new printer with insurance cover sold at a highly inflated price. But Mike's seen a sharp rise in these fake helplines selling fake annual printer repair subscriptions. So the basic package that they're offering, which is um, the best part of £60, is to fix the one-off problem that the, the consumer probably does have with their printer at this particular time. But ultimately what the scammer is trying to do is talk the consumer into signing up for the premium support package, which in this particular case is nearly £350. Having learnt that her father was conned into sending a cheque for £690 to a fake helpline, Sarah immediately told him to cancel the cheque. Luckily, he managed to do it before it was cashed. But sadly, this wasn't the end of it. For the next few days, every couple of hours, they were ringing him. So he got more and more agitated. He bought a new mobile. He didn't answer the other phones. He drew all the curtains. So he just literally hunkered down because he was very worried that um, somebody might turn up on his doorstep. Mike at Trading Standards is concerned these fake helplines are specifically targeting the more vulnerable members of society. They've got this rather well, special offer for senior citizens and of course that's one of the things that we would have concerns about. Hence we'll be doing some work to try and um, do our best to disrupt these websites. Earlier, we heard how Steve and Lillian Ritchie lost over £140,000 and were left homeless after they were conned by a fake property developer. This man, Barry Lee. Uh, in your, your mind, you don't want to believe that such a terrible thing is actually happening. Hampshire Trading Standards Officer Ben Meredith worked on the investigation to expose the fakery. He'd already discovered Barry Lee was using glossy brochures and magazine ads to make his fake development seem real. But Ben discovered Barry Lee wasn't just fooling buyers like Stephen Lillian. He was fooling businesses too. Here's a fake online banking statement that shows uh, Mr Lee has 980,000 in his account when in fact he did not. Mr Lee wasn't a millionaire, no, he didn't have anywhere near the funds that the account statement suggests that he did. Barry Lee used this fake bank statement to convince a local estate agent he was a legitimate developer, so they would find him more unsuspecting customers. Other businesses were taken in by these documents. Everyone thought Dream Coastal Country Homes was a legitimate business. Uh, the million pound claim was, was pretty damning. Uh, it just goes to show what lengths he would go to to try and make these deals work. But it wasn't just the land, the development and his bank accounts that Barry Lee was making fake claims about. Cheryl Tanner had to retire from the police force due to a leg injury. She and her husband Pete had also agreed to buy one of Barry Lee's off-plan timber homes. We were looking at properties in Cornwall and we came across this idea of bespoke homes. At the time, it just sounded such a unique and amazing you know, opportunity for ourselves and really for the children. As part of the deal to buy one of Barry's homes, they were even promised a job, working on the development once it was finished. He also had offered us a position uh, as the park managers to, to run the business for him, uh, with a wage included, uh, rent free. So, yeah, it was like, well, everything's fell into place. Yeah. And it was an amazing, it was, well, it was an amazing opportunity. How can you turn something down, you know, like that? But after securing a sale of their current home, choosing the fixtures and fittings for their new timber-built home, and even sorting out school places for their two boys close to the supposed development, 
Pete received an unexpected call from another customer of Barry Lee. He turned around and says, everything you've been told by Barry Lee is a con. Fake claims of job opportunities, fake claims of how, you know, plots of land that he owned, um, fake contracts, fake paperwork and, you know, all the blueprints. Yeah, everything about him. It's, yeah, he were a, a good salesman, a good con artist, but everything has come out with has been fake, hasn't it? It's... There isn't one ounce of truth in anything that he's, you know, offered, claimed, anything at all. It is, it, it's completely fake. Cheryl and Pete's lives were turned upside down. We could have lost absolutely everything. And with two young children as well, you know, it was absolutely horrendous. Pete and Cheryl have had a lucky escape. They hadn't sold their house or parted with any money. But Steve and Lillian Ritchie were not so fortunate. Having lost every penny they have, they're now living in this small rental property which isn't suitable for Lillian's mobility needs. Today, Steve and Lillian are on their way to show us the plot of land they thought they'd bought. This is the road now into Halsinger Village, where we had plot one. Uh, it's just down here and around the corner. It's quite, you know, it's, it's not the easiest of access, but hey, when you want to live rural, this is, you know, this is part of it. The land has since been sold, and all the park homes you can see here are nothing to do with Barry Lee's development. They're here. This was going to be our, our home, this plot here. And leading from the back of, of the unit would have been, you know, the, the quarter of an acre it was set in. That would have been where the animals were and the vegetables were and, and the likes. So this was going to be ideal for us, you know, being able to both live here and, uh, and have something to give to the rest of the people here and create a nice little community. Um, you know, and uh, that's, this is where it all went wrong. At Trading Standards, Ben pieced together the evidence against Barry Lee. He discovered the fake property developer had ripped off a string of people who had lost large sums of money. Uh, the scale of the fraud uh, in the end, uh, following our investigations, was over £600,000 worth of money had been taken from consumers with no discernible benefit for any of them. Dream Coast and Country Homes were creating the impression for consumers that they owned the sites they were selling, which wasn't the case. Today, Barry Lee is due in Portsmouth Crown Court, where he'll learn his fate. Steve and Lillian hope he gets the sentence he deserves. Well, we've come to the sentencing because this has been a, a long journey, not just for me and Lillian, but for all the other victims, and to see justice done. Steve understandably wants to know what's happened to his money, and outside court, he decides to confront Lee. Is the deals done, then? Huh? Have you done the deals? I've nothing to say to you. Come on. I've nothing. You've had extra time. I've nothing to say to you, my Hey, right? don't call me a Can you get your hands off me? Yeah. Get right. your hands off You watch it. You Hello. just headbutted me. Keep your hands off me. Well, I was just asking him a, a question and he turned uh, abusive and violent to me. No charges were brought against Lee for the incident here on the court steps. But in court, he was convicted of three counts of fraud, one of forgery and one count of using a false instrument. He was sent to prison for six years. We're pleased with the outcome. Uh, I think that fairly reflects um, his involvement and his criminality there. Um, and should serve as a deterrent to others who may be or are doing the same thing elsewhere. He may have gone to prison, but for Steve and Lillian, he's still taken every penny they ever had. It's not something that any of us will ever get over because we've spent a lifetime building up to where we got to have it all taken away. It was all fake, all of it, all of it. Yeah, it's been totally exposed in the courts here today. You'd think fakers would have the decency not to target children's safety. And kids' cycle helmets are a must. Experts say they're saving lives and stopping serious injury right across the country every day. But this one won't. 
it's a fake. And if your child had an accident while wearing one of these, the outcome could be catastrophic. Wales, the rolling hills, valleys and winding roads make it a cyclist's dream. So it's no surprise 12-year-old Evan Burgess has been taking to the tarmac since he was a wee nipper. Evan knows more than most how wearing a genuine, well-fitted helmet can be the difference between life and death. A few months ago, Evan went out for a ride after school, wearing his helmet as he always does. But on this occasion, things didn't go to plan. Yeah, it's a very narrow, single-track road. And I went round, and uh, the minibus was coming up. Evan was on a blind bend and had a head-on collision with a minibus coming the other way. He ended up trapped under the vehicle with life-threatening injuries. They were doing things like uh, putting the ventilator tube in, uh, putting incisions in my chest. Um, they put... Um, they injected painkillers directly into my shoulder, into the, like, into the centre of the bone there, um, putting cannulas in and um, antibiotics and things like that. 37 members of the emergency service were called to Evan's crash. He'd fractured his skull and broke his ribs, collarbone and femur and was airlifted to hospital. For the first five days I was in intensive care, and um, for, those, for three of those days, I was completely sedated. They were breathing for me. I was just lying in the bed, not doing anything for myself. And then I got out of hospital, and then for another four weeks after that, I was still using a frame, so I couldn't walk any distance, really. So I was in a wheelchair, mostly, for another four weeks after I came home. The doctors told Evan's father, Tom, the helmet had undoubtedly saved his son's life. He did have a skull fracture, so obviously without a helmet, uh, I think that probably would have been a life-ending injury, really. So this would have, I think, scraped along the floor, which makes sense, because this is sort of where my head got the biggest bashing. Uh, this is where the skull fracture is, and also my, a bit of my ear came off there. Um, and But you can just tell... Uh, by sort of the state that it's in, all the uh, impact that it took. Had Evan not been wearing a genuine helmet, things would have had a rather different outcome. Incredibly lucky in so many different ways. This was birthday money that I spent this on, so uh, definitely money well spent. In the UK, all children cycle helmets need to undergo rigorous safety testing before they can go to market and get issued with a CE mark stating they conform to European safety standards. But what if the CE mark was fake and the helmet hadn't undergone any safety testing and, more worryingly, offered absolutely no protection when called upon in an accident like Evans? Doug Walkman, head of Derby Trading Standards, dealt with one such case. We first heard about a particular shop called Discount Outlet. A member of the public alerted us to the possibility that the shop was selling counterfeit goods. One of the products on sale that they were concerned about was this child's cycle helmet. And it was quickly obvious something was amiss. It's more the helmet itself by just touching it and feeling it. It just doesn't feel that it's, there's something not quite right about it. And as they examined it further, it wasn't just the quality of the helmet that Doug's team were worried about. There are a number of spelling mistakes throughout some of the literature that came through it. I mean, it, that says sports, should say protection, I should imagine. Printed on the inside of the helmet is a CE mark which should state the product complies with European safety regulations. However, judging by the build quality of the helmet and the numerous spelling mistakes, Doug suspected this CE mark was fake. These are all little telltale signs that we're dealing with possibly a fake product um, and hence why we, we sent it off and decided to have it further, you know, further tests carried out. The helmet has been sent to Paul Ellis. Today he's going to carry out a number of specialist impact tests on the helmet to find out whether it complies with European safety regulation or whether the CE mark printed on the inside of the helmet is fake. Uh, we're going to set up the, uh, the helmet on the test head form to see how sturdy that part of the helmet is. 
the machine Paul strapped the helmet onto is going to carry out what's known as drop testing. Put simply, the helmet is dropped onto a weight to simulate the type of impact it would sustain in a crash. The helmet is uh, in position as it would be when a person would be wearing the helmet. The first of two tests will assess the helmet's ability to deal with an impact to the front of the skull. This particular site is a, a temple, uh, so obviously a delicate part of the head that we want to make sure the helmet is protecting. Uh, we're ready to hoist the carriage up and drop it and form the impact. So straight away we can see that this helmet has failed on a flat impact. Uh, the maximum acceleration, we're looking for something less than 250 g. This is over 750, which is immediately a massive failure, um, offering no protection at all. The helmet is three times over the limit outlined in safety guidelines. Uh, it's quite rare that we see something so bad. And there's more to come. Next, Neil realigns the helmet ready for a second drop test. This one will assess how the helmet holds up if it had an impact with a curb. This one failed again. We have 600G on a 250G limit. It's not just over the limit, it's over double the limit. It's, it's not offering the protection it should. So it leads us to probably question the CE marking of that product. As, as, as not being legitimate. This helmet is not only fake, it's a very dangerous one. Neurosurgeon Lewis Thorne has years of experience dealing with head injuries. As he looks over our test footage, he's shocked by the severity of the injuries this fake could have caused to our children. An injury to the back of the head like this could produce a severe and life-changing brain injury. And if the injury is sufficiently severe, or if there's bleeding or other problems that complicate it, it would put the child's life at risk. And what's more shocking is this fake child cycle helmet was found on sale on a British high street, meaning any one of us could have purchased it for a child thinking it was safe. I'm fairly confident if I just push my hands together, this is going to go. I wouldn't want that to happen to my children. At Derby Trading Standards, Doug was determined to make sure it didn't happen to anyone's children. He built a case against the shop selling the helmets and we're happy to report it was a success. The person and the company were both con convicted of offences, a number of offences, uh, which resulted in, in fines uh, and also a community order. But be aware, these fakes might be off the market, but Doug fears there could still be other fakes complete with fake CE marks on sale out there. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, we're dealing with this again in the, in the near future. That's all from Fake Britain. Goodbye. to a world where nothing is quite as it seems. Welcome to Fake Britain. Get on! Get on! Get on the floor now! Don't put your hand behind your back now! Here at the Fake Britain House, we'll reveal the fakes that are flooding the market, calling people like you and me and making money for the criminals. We'll investigate the fraudsters who are selling us something that isn't real and could be dangerous, and will help you avoid falling for a fake. Today on Fake Britain, a faker selling houses that didn't exist, that left some people homeless and penniless. Your mind, you don't want to believe that such a terrible thing is actually happening. 
And at the court, the man behind the con attacks one of his victims. Hey, you just netbotted me! Fake children cycle helmets, potentially putting thousands of lives at risk. I wouldn't want that to happen to my children. Fake printer helplines targeting the most vulnerable members of society. I queried the level of £690, and I was told that my father had elected for lifetime insurance cover. Well, my father's 91, you know, he wasn't going to go for lifetime cover. And an enforcement operation reveals fake tobacco packaged as dried mushrooms. It's a very professional setup. They've shipped it in with the deliberate intent to mislead the ports, and it's very organised and professional gangs by the looks of it. For most of us, buying a house is the single biggest investment we'll ever make in our lifetimes. And here in Britain, around two-thirds of us are lucky enough to own our own home. Over the last 10 years, Britain has seen a sharp rise in buying properties off plan, which means agreeing to buy a house that hasn't yet been built. And they're in high demand. These properties are often part of new developments, with entrepreneurs buying land and getting plans drawn up before producing glossy brochures to lure buyers. But what if the developer was faking it and he didn't own the land, had no intention of building any houses, and it was all part of an elaborate fake to rob you of your life savings? Steve and Lillian Ritchie have always owned their own home. Lillian suffers with mobility issues and is now registered disabled. Money is tight, so to help make ends meet, they wanted a property that was cheaper to run. We lived in Leicestershire. We had a nice bungalow, all adaptions for her disabilities. Um, but still, it was uh, a bit much to keep, so we was looking to, to downsize, maybe do something a little bit different, easier, and have a better quality of life. They'd always dreamt of living near the sea and owning a small holding where they could live a simple life, growing their own fruit and vegetables and rearing animals. And they thought they'd found just what they were looking for when they heard about a company selling off-plan timber homes in Devon called Dream Coastal and Country Homes, not to be confused with any other company with a similar name. Spoke with the marketing manager and she basically totally sold it to us. It was ideal, so it, it went from there. We made an appointment to go and see some land, um, and it, it was absolutely brilliant. Barry Lee was the man behind the company. And he just came over as a, a, a really nice chap uh, that would go out of his way to, to, to create for you exactly uh, what you wanted, you know? So there was no, nothing that made me think untoward or anything. He is a very confident, professional guy. Steve and Lillian viewed a plot of land. Barry told them he owned it and had planning permission to build on it. Barry also said these plots were in high demand and they're selling fast. We met him there and he told us that the, uh, there's lots of interest in this um, development. Um, so on viewing the land, if you to show you that you was genuine, then a £1,900 deposit plot reservation would be needed to be made to secure that plot. Having paid a holding deposit, Steve and Lillian agreed to pay a further £140,000 for one of Barry Lee's off-plan timber homes. Barry's company even helped sell their bungalow, which would give them just enough money to buy their dream timber home. Contracts were drawn up and the money from the sale of their bungalow was held by Barry whilst the details of their timber house were finalised. So you just chose the spec, how big you wanted it, how many rooms you wanted. <laughs> Where you wanted your plug holes. Uh, every mortal thing. Steve and Lillian couldn't wait to see their new house finally built. So much so, they decided to live on the plot whilst the construction took place. We was living on the piece of land for maybe a week or so. Uh, you know, really enjoying it. Every day we was bursting to get up and start doing things, you know. But their excitement was short-lived. The house was never built, and they received a visit from someone who claimed to own the land, rather than Barry Lee. That's when we realised something is totally wrong with this deal, um, and started doing our own sort of investigations and ringing round the the park home industry people, the landowners, to try and find out what is really going on. 
Steve and Lillian weren't the only ones looking into Barry Lee. Over 100 miles away in Hampshire, Trading Standards Officer Ben Meredith had got wind of Barry Lee's dodgy dealings after receiving complaints from a number of disgruntled customers. Dreamcoast and Country Homes were essentially trying to sell victims or consumers their dream, um, painting this picture of a lovely existence on the southwest coast of England. We'd had a couple of consumer complaints come to us indicating that something was up with Dream Coastal and Country Homes. Uh, so we then decided to look into it further and see what the situation was because there were large sums of money being uh, talked about. So we need to look into that. Ben came across marketing material which Dream Coastal and Country Homes was giving to their prospective customers. And on the surface, it looked like a legitimate property development company. Here's an example of uh, the advertising material that would be in park home builders' offices. The advertising material was really professional, well-produced, uh, looked exactly the part. It contained all the information you'd expect to see about the development and the off-plan properties. All of these documents were part of the impression he was creating to indicate that the business owned the land they were selling and that they were doing well and were reputable to deal with. But there was one major problem. Barry Lee was a complete fraud. He didn't own the land he was selling and he had no intention of building any timber homes. He was a fake property developer and he'd just robbed Steve and Lillian of their life savings, leaving them with no money, no home and no hope of ever getting it back. I couldn't sleep. Uh, I, f I felt agitated. I was very depressed. Uh, no matter what anybody said about it, it's all going to work out, I, I knew within my heart that there was something radically wrong here. Uh, in your your mind, you don't want to believe that such a terrible thing is actually happening. And Steve and Lillian weren't the only ones. Ben discovered Barry Lee had taken out advertisements in magazines sold all over Britain. This is an example of the advertising material that Dream Coast and Country Homes are using in uh, Country Home Press, Country Home magazines. Once Barry Lee had lured his customers in and struck a deal, he wanted to get his hands on hundreds of thousands of pounds of their money. So he issued them paperwork like this. Here is an example of the agreement which clearly shows on here that Dream Coast and Country Homes are the owner, when in fact they're not. Uh, victims were taken in by these documents, other businesses were taken in by these documents. Everyone thought Dream Coast and Country Homes was a legitimate business. Later, we learn there were simply no limits to this fakery. Here's an example of where Mr Lee uh, forged a online banking document to make it look like he had nearly a million pounds in their bank. And we witness a shocking act of violence when Steve confronts the man behind the fake development. In Lewisham, South London, the authorities are battling the latest trend in the fight against fake cigarettes. Here, criminal gangs are illegally importing shredded tobacco in bulk into Britain, then producing packets of fake rolling tobacco in backstreet factories all over South London. Crime enforcement and regulations manager Nick Stabler is leading the fight against the fakers. This is how we'd normally find the products imported. First of all, you'll see that it's, it's in a Pampers box. Uh, this is going to... this is designed to put, uh, put customs off. Inside, we've got a bag of tea, but actually, instead of having tea inside, it's got the shredded tobacco bales. Once gangs have smuggled it into Britain using fake packaging, it's then turned into fake rolling tobacco by rehydrating it with white vinegar and adding vanilla essence. They will mix it all together to make it feel and smell like the, uh, like the real, real product as opposed to the fake product. They will then take a wadge of this and place it in one of their pre-made fake packaging. This fake rolling tobacco claims to be the well-known brand Amber Leaf. And there's one more thing to fool by as it's the real deal before it's sold in high street shops. They'll seal it and then for the final touch, they'll add a duty, a duty paid stamp so that people will, uh, will believe that it is a genuine product rather than being fake and they're more likely to buy it and smoke it. For the seven million smokers in Britain, this spells bad news. 
the people that are making this fake product are producing a product which is potentially uh, potentially unsafe for the individual smoking it. You just don't know what you're going to be finding in it. Okay, Ron, thanks for coming this morning. Because the team have found so much of this fake tobacco across South London, they've launched a big operation to clamp down on the gangs behind this racket. The fake Britain cameras have been allowed in to see what's really going on. It's quite a large problem at the moment. We are working pan, pan London, across London, with, um, uh, with other, other boroughs to tackle it. The 10-strong team will be raiding a number of different premises linked to the production and sale of this fake rolling tobacco. Thank you very much. Any questions? The team suspect the illegal tobacco is coming in from overseas through a series of high street mailbox shops scattered across South London. Crime enforcement and regulation manager Julian Wyard is on his way to carry out a raid. They have intelligence the address is being used to traffic the fakes. This is where the fake goods are import. They come through the airports and into these uh, these sorts of businesses where they're collected by individuals and then taken to the uh, factories where they're actually packaged up in the um, counterfeit fake packaging. There's no guarantees they'll find any, but Julian is feeling quite optimistic. I'm hoping to find um, raw tobacco. And if we're lucky, we, we, we could get uh, quite a large amount. Julian is joined by dog handler Stuart Phillips, who's looking after the team's secret weapon, Yo-Yo, the sniffer dog. He's trained to find any type of tobacco product, genuine tobacco, counterfeit tobacco, shisha. Um, and we'd obviously we'd go into the shops and after trading the standards have, um, have done their uh, introduction bit, um, then Yo-Yo will, uh, will do his bit then. OK. Once inside the high street mailbox shop, 